And back in 1970, people got together. Uh, they had been involved in a conference, and I think this was down at the Ontario College of Art, as I recall, uh, talking about the need for media education and talking about the, the role media could play in the educational system. And I wasn't involved at that point, but Barry Duncan and some other people were. So they began to, to meet regularly as an organization. And at the beginning, it wasn't English teachers exclusively at all. A number of these people were production people, uh, independent filmmakers, uh, people who worked for the National Film Board for TVO. But Barry Duncan was an English teacher, and the people who became attracted to it through knowing Barry were other English teachers. So that the AML became a major force lobbying with the Ministry of Education to have media literacy made part of the official curriculum of Ontario schools, which happened in 87. And now it is an official part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and why was the, the decision made that English should be the sort of mm -hmm. logical yeah, English is certainly uh, not the place where other countries often put media literacy. We do in Ontario. I'm not sure why the decision was made to start in English. It could easily spread out to other subject areas, and the ministry would encourage this, in fact. And the media resource book that came out in 89 talks about strategies for getting media out of English departments and into fine arts, into history, into science. But I think the feeling originally, Joe, was that English could do the best job first on this, that, it, that so many of the, the normal methods of analysis of television and film and so on fell naturally into kind of the context of, of critical reading. So if you could critically read a book, you could critically read a film, and you could critically read a television show. And this is the language the Ministry of Education uses. They make this parallel between critical reading of print and critical reading of the mass media. So English has kind of taken ownership for that reason, but also because most of the developmental stuff being done in media is done by English teachers. So we have solidified our position, if you'd like, by developing courses of studies and units that build it into the English curriculum. Uh, but there is a difference between uh, the formalist kind of reading of a text and the formalist reading of, mm -hmm. uh, of the televisual event, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and an English teacher may not have the confidence or the knowledge to, to essentially do a decoding of a televisual event. So uh, how do you give English teachers that knowledge? Mm -hmm. Well, it's true English teachers don't, as part of their training in English, yet get that kind of background. And that's why we have conferences like the conference we're at now, where we try and talk about ideology, values, methods, uh, how, it, how things are done with students. And we try to give teachers two things. We try to give them some kind of phys philosophical basis for what we're, we're doing. And we talk about uh, deconstruction, and we talk about ideology, and we talk about values. And then we give them a very practical kind of hands-on approach, often by getting teachers with a little more experience to talk about methods that have worked for them. And uh, we build it up this way, but we put, I think, our emphasis on the practice uh, at least as much, if not more, than on the theory. And this distinguishes us from popular culture departments and universities that tend to be very theory-heavy. Are there any strategies right now to open up uh, maybe a literacy to other uh, disciplines? Not specifically. Uh, we're, we're by no means excluding them, but right now we're concentrating on developing skills for English teachers. Um, the time has come, but uh, so far from what I've seen, other subject areas don't seem to have a lot of interest. What do you think that is? I think because, um, partly because the ministry came out with a guideline that, that, that sort of focused on English. I mean, English has to teach media. Other subject areas don't. So that the only, the only teachers who will operate from other subject areas are those who are already keen. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people who are. A number of teachers in art, uh, people with fine arts backgrounds, have taken uh, media literacy training courses, have come to workshops and sessions, and have incorporated that into part of what they do. But I think the reason there aren't more of them is because art teaching has always had a very practical basis. It's, a, it's more a skill and technique than a critical discussion course. Um, students are taught how to draw and paint rather than how to interpret and and comment on the things in the media. So that's why we kind of still have it. Uh, it seems to me a, it, it's sort of a grab bag approach right now because all the, the uh, sessions that you have, you just go all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's also important to kind of have a, a, a theoretical ground mm -hmm. in this stuff. How is media literacy trying to develop uh, a theoretical ground, which is also mm -hmm. Canadian. You know, one of the problems that, that uh, I think it's a problem is that I think I'm going to borrow from different theoretical 
Well, media is unique in that we're not borrowing anything from the Americans. Uh, the United States is, is years behind us in developing any kind of critical approach to media literacy. Where American schools do it, if they do it at all, it's production-based. Uh, we borrow from Australians and, and from Britons largely because they're ahead of everyone else. And uh, we're much more structured than it might appear here. Most teachers have had some, some structural background, and there is resource material available that goes through separate genres of, of film and television. And we read extensively and try to bring in things we have found in popular culture writings, uh, writings of Henry Giroux and uh, Aronowitz and Paul Simon and so on. And uh, We do our best to try and supply teachers with some philosophical background from our own reading. But teachers are a little bit suspicious of something that's too heavily theoretical. They want a practical, understandable, hands-on approach that they can sell to students. So we do kind of a basic deconstruction approach to things. And this leads teachers to the same thing we do with students, to questioning why we do it this way. What are the values that underlie this? What are the assumptions we're making when we talk about gender, when we talk about violence? Uh, what kind of, of, of social values do we bring to this? And, and so the philosophy comes with the practice, rather than laying down some kind of philosophical groundwork and then building practice on top. The two go hand in hand. Well, the other question is, Well, you know, it's funny. The Australians and Scots got so deeply into media study because they were relatively small cultures dominated by other people. The Scots felt dominated by British media. The Australians dominated by American media. And because they were so removed from it, I think it was easier for them to be critical of it at a distance. We are very critical of being dominated by American media. And one of the themes that constantly comes up at workshops and in the classroom is the fact that Almost all the media we watch the most avidly is American media, just like horror films are, almost always American horror films. And, and we don't, so far don't have a big agenda on nationalism that we're taking a position, but we are often teaching students that the values that we have been given and the attitudes and, and so many of the other things are, in fact, imported. Uh, what does the, the media studies curriculum look like? Right now, the ministry's guideline is very vague. It says that one-third of the time in an intermediate-level English course that is compulsory must be media, and one-third of the time in a senior course. So in theory, all English students coming through the Ontario school system will have had at least um, 12 weeks of intensive media work. Now, right now, there is no mandate for what you have to cover. Uh, sometimes different teachers, different school boards take different approaches entirely. And, you know, it's like literature. Uh, you choose for your students what you think they should read. Uh, there are committees to investigate and approve books, but most schools have a fair bit of freedom in doing this, and, and individual English departments can choose novels or discard novels as they see fit. It's the same way with media. You know, we do certain units at my school, and if we find better ones, we'll switch to those. But right now, there is no provincial standard for what you have to cover. Now, the Association of Media provides these seminars. Part is it for teachers to it's, it's to retool, it's to, to exchange ideas, because teachers get most of their good ideas from other teachers. And it's to bring new material, new books that are published, new ideas, new critical essays, to the attention of teachers who might be able to use them. Well, the students get 12 weeks. How many weeks do the teacher get of uh, media literacy? Well, it depends. If they take a summer course, they might get a month. Other than that, the only uh, way to get into kind of formal in-service training is to take uh, Association for Media Literacy workshop courses. Um, some school boards provide in-service training within their own board, but we try to spread ourselves around and do it involving teachers from all over the place. Um, yeah, it's probably worth noting that, that Ontario is easily, I mean, even though we are still in its infancy, we are far ahead of anywhere else in, in Canada. And Ontario is easily the leader in North America in developing media literacy curriculum. So even though we've only just begun, we've come quite a distance. We have a lot of good, solid stuff to point to. And as a, as a sort of political group that is able to generate some kind of change, uh, mm -hmm. and the links with people that would be essential. Sure. Um, do you think that it's going to be a sort of a movement that is going to make a change? And I'm sure you can say yes, but uh, realistically, a change in what? Students' attitudes and outcomes? Students' attitudes and outcomes, 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, students uh, right now have no critical look at the media at all. In fact, media that's not print rarely comes into the classroom other than in the most superficial kind of way of we've read the book, now here's the movie if you're good. So that anything we do is an improvement. But eventually, I think students will become much more critical and much more able to feel that they are a little bit in control of their media lives, that, that they understand how things are done and why they're done. They understand the commercial basis of most broadcasting. And uh, this is an improvement. Now, we've got a long way to go. I mean, for example, we don't yet treat print as a medium. We treat print as, as sacred text. We never question its production, authorship, conventions. Uh, we do this to the electronic media, but we've got to come full circle and come back to looking at the books we've always taught in a much more critical method. So there's still a long way to go. Obviously, you have to do that because it's dominated there, mm -hmm. uh, and you use it and, and, uh, and link it back to literacy. Uh, there's also sort of a cognitive shift that happens when you, when you live in a world that is submerged by your kind of media. Uh, you, you patterns of recognition, you, you cognitive that whatever change. Uh, how are you going to bring them back to literacy, which requires a totally different? Well, we're, we're kind of committing ourselves to the approach that everything will reinforce everything else. And we're hoping that by making people more critical of, of electronic media, they'll become more critical of other things, such as their own cultural habits, their own popular culture, but also the books they read as well. Uh, and that this will make students not just consumers of media and people who are often required to memorize and regurgitate factual information, but they'll become much more critical of the things schools are doing to them the things they do to their own lives. So that we, we don't see electronic media as divorced from print. Ultimately, we'd like to integrate the two. And, and this is often a selling job. Parents, school officials, students themselves often see print as the superior literacy, the real purpose of school. And electronic media literacy is strictly kind of a minor little adjunct that doesn't have a lot of weight. And we want to try and change that notion. And we hope that the critical thinking skills they get in one area will carry over to the other area. Oh, I'd, I'd be happy with just that. Those are those are worthy goals. Yes, um, but, but then what happens is that you sort of uh, you, you left as though uh, if you're that critical, then the only thing that you can do is simply chronicle the triumph of the ideology that's out there. Sometimes. Um, you know, students are also involved in production. So they do increasingly get a chance to do things themselves in a creative way. And, and we're not critical only in a negative sense. The purpose is to inoculate students against the media. Often, uh, students are taught to appreciate the things the media can do and, and the ways in which it does it. You know, certainly we want to make them critical because of the vast power the media has and make them aware of how they are often manipulated in ways they don't see, but we, we certainly don't take a, a totally negative approach at all. And in fact, many of our, our students will go on to jobs in the media and see this as a perfectly valid career. And, and if in part that's a result of our work, then we feel good about that. I, mean, I could do this all day. I mean, we do this for a living. What do you, what do you mean when you say you see it as a, they see it as a, as a legitimate career? Oh, I mean, we, the, the results of taking media literacy courses in high school are not going to be that you think, geez, I'd never want to work in the media. Oh, There's see. such sleazy buggers. Yeah. It's just ripping people off. We, we don't take that approach. And a lot of the students who do well in media literacy uh, often you know, will be taken to a shoot, will go to a studio, and find it intriguing and fascinating and realize that this is an area where there's a lot of potential for creative and critical people. And uh, you know, we're very happy to do that. And when community colleges, in fact, get in touch with us and say, hey, uh, you're teaching this, would you people like to come to an open house? We say, terrific, yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know, students often go on and start as cable pullers and work their way up and be producers. And uh, if we have uh, a hand in that, we're, we're happy to encourage it. And a, a lot of students who you know, I and other teachers who've been in media literacy for a while have had, have, in fact, gone into the media and have come back and, and talked to our students and uh, opened up other avenues. So we, we certainly are not at all opposed to, to professional production. I think it's moved beyond the high school level now, and the college level now. Yeah. The Ministry of Education's official stance is that, that production-based stuff that's to lead to jobs is a college-level thing. 
and that the high schools are supposed to look at it aesthetically, uh, critically, uh, in terms of, of visual literacy skills. But uh, we'd like to see a, a, a nicer link than that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they could be. Yeah. But a lot, of, a lot of my students, for example, get keen on going to Ryerson. Uh, and, and they see that what they've done in high school is the beginning of what could turn into some very interesting stuff. So we, we certainly try to steer teachers away from taking the inoculation approach that isn't this insidious, let's learn how they do their dirty stuff. Um, Yeah, it was a, a question really about the politics of, of uh, you know, being an, being an educator and having a territory and defending a territory. Uh, oftentimes that happens in an institution. So mm -hmm. do, you, do you foresee any kind of problems with that? Well, no, the funny thing is English as a compulsory subject area is not an area that ever has to sell its Other areas do. I mean, history and science and, and things that are to a large extent optional have to compete. Now, we've taken on media literacy. If other areas got into it, they could probably use this to make their subjects more saleable. Uh, history, for example, or uh, man in society courses or art courses. And, and we'd be happy to share because we, we have a lot. But so far, it's not in my experience this is happening much. English departments still hang on to the media part and often create separate media literacy courses. And other departments have, nobody's ever accused me yet of being greedy or, or, or come up and said, I'd like a piece of the action. How be, how be I do film? Um, it might be nice to come to that. Art departments probably could do film as well or better uh, than we could, since many of them are into already still photography, and some of them are into Super 8 and things, and uh, you know have gone into Video 8 now and are into the production end. So how would a student, let's say, or some a faculty member, which is all experience, Well, we'd have to talk to them about the difference between just making films or looking at films and, and doing media literacy, which involves the whole idea of critical awareness, uh, looking at technique and looking at ideology and looking at values and all of these larger things. And this is why probably art teachers with very technical backgrounds have not yet showed much interest. They're much happier teaching photography than, than trying to do kind of critical readings of, of different photographers. And would they have to be accredited by I don't know what kind of upgrading they would have to take in order to satisfy whatever requirements. Right now there is a, there is a formula for taking a specialist certificate in media literacy, and there are a number of things you have to do. Other subject skill areas haven't got into this yet, and and I hope do. I hope I hope should. It shouldn't be seen as just an English thing. Yeah. Well, there's there's kind of a parallel thrust. Uh, the whole notion of of teaching literacy has always been in the past confined to English departments. Like we were supposed to do spelling and grammar, and other departments were able to just read and mark for content and. The ministry for years has been working against that, and it's called language across the curriculum to try and teach all teachers to be critical of students' writing and reading skills. And it's having some effect, but, but mostly other teachers still see this as an English area. And, and the same with media. We shouldn't hang on to it, and we're not trying to, but nobody else has shown much interest. So we've kind of given birth to and are rearing this thing, but if somebody else wants to buy in, we're open. Well, I hope it grows. Oh, we do all the time ethical issues, yeah. Oh, okay. um, we try to incorporate the whole ethics, values, business. Uh, we do, we look at the news business. Uh, we look at uh, newspapers as a medium and ethical decisions it has to make. You know, we look at the, the argument between balancing the public's right to know against uh, the, the right of public or of, of private people to have a private life. We, we kick that around as a as sort of a, an ongoing issue that's part of, of, of being in the media. So yeah, ethics are a big part of it.